Hi, and welcome to Wrenching Up, where we tackle the projects and demonstrate the procedures that you, our customers, ask us to do. We've got two very interesting projects today. The first is an 06 Cummins turbo diesel with an induction leak somewhere. And the second one is a quick diagnostic procedure for finding where those U codes are coming from on an OBD2 CAN bus. Let's get started. Our customer here is using a smoke machine to save on diagnostic time. However, they are curious about high pressure applications like on a turbo diesel. That's a great point, Eddie. And we've got one of those vehicles in the shop right now. And with us today is Lee Morrison from Redline Detection, and he's going to help us with that. Lee, tell us a little bit about smoke machine testing. Well, Jim, smoke machine testing has primarily been used in the automotive industry for years, but it's been basically based around low pressure systems, naturally aspirated engines, intakes, evaps, things of that nature. When we get into the forced induction turboed vehicles, it just doesn't have the pressure or the volume to cut it. So we developed the power smoke machine, high pressure, specifically for diagnosing these systems. That's great. Tell us a little bit about this machine. Well, the machine's very similar to your standard smoke machine with a few different features. One of the primary features is the power supply. It runs either off of DC current like most people are used to. It also can run off of AC current. So if you've got the vehicle up in the air, can't necessarily get to your 12 volt battery easily, you can plug it into the wall. And up front, we've got a few subtle differences. The pressure regulator, so we can adjust the internal pressure we're applying to the system. The gauge that goes with it. The most important feature on the front is actually our back pressure gauge. This determines how much pressure we're building in the system so we can determine where we need to check for flow and for leaks. And then we've got our flow meter, which is standard for most smoke machines, just so we can determine the size of our leak. Well, one of the big things I notice is not round anymore. It's a square box, so tell us about that. Well, Jim, we had to design this machine to be able to withstand anything it might get put through during these applications. And because of all the components that this machine houses, we had to accommodate for the size. Great. Well, let's get this hooked up and get this vehicle diagnosed. Absolutely. Okay, what's next? Well, now we have to install that intake adapter. Wow, tell us about this. Well, what we have, Jim, is an expandable bladder that conforms to just about any shape or size intake manifold or induction system to fit most all vehicles on the market. Well, show us how it works. Sure. All right, Jim, if you could just give me a little bit of shop air, we'll get this bladder inflated. All right, Jim, it looks like we're about all done with our installation. Why don't we go ahead and power up the machine? Okay. Okay, Lee, well, what's going to be different about this test? Well, Jim, normally with your smoke test and your standard machine, the only thing you can control is flow. With this machine, we can also control the pressure. So what we want to do with this is we're going to turn on our flow control knob and slowly start increasing our pressure and to a modest level until we start to see a leak. So you can see, Jim, the only way you're going to find a leak on a forced induction engine like this is with a high-pressure test machine. That is just great. Well, let's get this truck fixed and get it back on the road. All right. Our customer here wants to know if there's a quick and easy way to check the CAN bus when U-codes are present in their diagnostics. What do you do with those U-codes that you get on your scan tool? You know, those communication errors. Well, you know, in today's cars, there's, what, 80-some computers, 100,000 lines of code. We're going to get some communication errors, and it's going to happen more and more as time goes on. And what do you do then? Is it a module, a sensor, an actuator? Is it wiring in the, in the CAN bus itself? We need a fast way to check the CAN bus, and I've got a 15-minute solution for you. Let me show you how to do that. The first thing you'll want to do is connect up between pins 6 and 14 in the OBD2 connector. Now, notice at each end of the circuit, there is a 120-ohm resistor. Now, the meter itself, though, is reading 60 ohms. Why is that? Because when resistors are hooked up in a parallel circuit, they divide. Let's take a look at that on the bench. To better understand how that works, let's use this simple circuit to see how these resistors behave first in a series and then in a parallel circuit. So we're going to use an ohm meter and turn that on to ohms. And then I'm just going to connect the leads of the ohm meter across the resistor. And we can see that it's about 120 ohms. Remember, there are two 120 ohm resistors, one on each end of the CAN bus circuit. So if we connect that up into a series circuit, in other words, through the, from the meter through the jumper wire across one resistor, then through the other resistor, now we have a series circuit. And we have about 240 ohms because in a series circuit, the resistance adds. But what about a parallel circuit? 
Now to make a parallel circuit, what we'll do is disconnect the circuit and make it a little bit different. Now we'll connect the resistor in parallel with the other resistor. So now we have two resistors in parallel. Watch what happens when we hook up the ohmmeter now. We have about 60 ohms. Remember, a series circuit adds, a parallel circuit divides. And that's why we have 60 ohms on the CAN bus circuit. We check pins 6 and 14 in the OBD2 connector with our ohmmeter. Well, now that we know that the CAN bus is intact, you could move on to your next diagnostic step, which may be using the bi-directional feature on your scan tool to address each of the modules on the bus and make sure that they're responding properly, and then move on to the sensors and the actuators until we find the cause of that communications problem.